uh, we had to distill a list of 180 nominees down to 40, an incredibly challenging task, uh, but rewarding nevertheless. In reviewing the applications, the judges sought a roughly equal distribution of awardees across, across each of the nine categories and reviewed each application based on the following criteria. Firstly, we sought that they stood out in their field, that they had preeminence in their chosen industry, both ideally locally and globally. Secondly, that they were making a contribution to Asian Australian relations, that they had a commitment to that engagement and they were building closer ties between communities. Third, we were seeking demonstrated evidence that they helped break the bamboo ceiling. They were notable for pioneering Asian Australian leadership and influence within their field. And fourth, we sought evidence that they were inspiring others, that they had demonstrated impact either in mentoring, community development, or in some other way. So without further ado, let's turn to the first category, and that is arts and culture in which there were five um, awardees. Uh, and let me start with those before revealing the winner of the arts and culture category. The awardees are Corey Chen, director and screenwriter, Bhakti Puvananantharan, an editor of ABC Life at ABC, Dr. Mikala Tai, the director of 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art, Geraldine Viswanathan, an actor, writer, and producer. And the winner of the arts and culture category is Pearl Tan, senior lecturer in directing at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. Pearl is a screen content maker and educator and founding director of Pearly Productions, a filmmaking boutique that focuses on conversations amongst people with diverse backgrounds. She balances this pursuit with her role as a senior lecturer in directing at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School, where she's instrumental in influencing and guiding the next generation of storytellers and shapes the school's policy regarding diversity and inclusion. Congratulations, Pearl, really thrilled for you. We'll now hear from Pearl. Hello, my name is Pearl Tan. My parents are Chinese from Malaysia and I was born on Wajak Noongar land in Perth in Western Australia. I am a filmmaker and educator, currently in the role of senior lecturer in directing at AFTERS and I also sit on the boards of the Australian Directors Guild and Critical Stages Touring. I'm also doing my PhD in creative practice at UNSW. I'm super grateful to be acknowledged as an influencer in the arts. The arts and in particular storytelling are major culture shapers in society. Representation is crucial and plays a key part in the way we see ourselves and the way we see each other. And it's really great to see more Asian Australian creators taking ownership of their own stories, which is leading to more diversity and more authentic representation of Asian Australian creators um, and stories on our screens. But there's still a long way to go. The handful of stories that we see uh, mean that there is unbelievable scrutiny on that small number of stories and the creators, um, not only to break through and have their stories seen, but when they do, there's this extraordinary pressure for them to represent all of us and in a way that we're all happy with. Basically, what I'm saying is that we need more Asian Australian stories. And not only that, we need more stories from other represented groups, all people of colour, First Nations, disability, LGBTQ and more. More nuanced portrayals of underrepresented groups and intersectional stories where characters and identities can have more than one marginalised group uh, in their identity at a time. I look forward to seeing more of this as time goes on and I look forward to being a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Pearl. What a wonderful uh, message from Pearl. Let me move now to the community and advocacy and not-for-profit category where we had five very deserving awardees. Uh, they were Tarang Chala, Ambassador at Our Watch, Sally Hetherington, the CEO of Human and Hope Association, Marion Muhammad, a speaker, facilitator and co-founder of Money Girl, Tim Losudo, 
the founder and national director of Democracy in Colour, but the overall winner for the community and advocacy not-for-profit category is Danny Huey, the founder and CEO of Same View. And uh, Danny's message and uh, story really touched the judges. Having been a very successful executive in the utilities industry, specialising in disaster management, Danny's family was touched uh, by his son's diagnosis of a rare disease that propelled him to, find, to found SameView, a support that an innovative, uh, innovative online platform that connects families with the right team of caregivers uh, to support children with disabilities. It advocates more effective healthcare delivery through improved collaboration networks that currently support over 1,000 people across Australia and New Zealand. Congratulations, Danny, an incredibly inspiring story. We'll now hear from Danny. Hi there, I'm Danny Hui. I was born in Hong Kong. I migrated to Australia in 89. And since then, I've had the amazing opportunity to enjoy all of the beautiful gifts that this country has given me. I'm also the father of two young children with disability, and I'm the founder of SameView, which is a technology platform that supports families just like mine to coordinate their disability care. Uh, thank you so much to the Asian Australian Leadership Summit for this incredible honour. Uh, when I first found out about this award, I felt that I wasn't worthy of such a title. And reflecting on that, I think there is some truth to um, Asian Australians and migrants like myself uh, often not seeing ourselves in positions of uh, community leadership. And so with this amazing opportunity, uh, what I hope to do is to encourage other Asian Australians to recognise their own capabilities and the opportunities that are given to us in this incredible country to have a go and make a social impact for all Australians. Thank you. Thanks, Denny. Danny, uh, an incredible um, message of hope and inspire, inspiration. So we move now to the corporate category where we have uh, four awardees. Christopher Kong, the Director of Data and Digital Transformation at Danone in China. Dr. Kaushik Sridhar, the Group Manager of Social Responsibility and ESG Reporting at Evolution Mining. Shamane Tan, the author and founder of Cyber Risk Meetup and the Chief Growth Officer at Privasec. And the category winner for the corporate category is Shelley Trull, managing partner of Reach Australia and Second Century Ventures. Shelley has led investment decision making for two venture firms in the last five years, including Reach Australia and Second Century Ventures, the second largest global prop tech fund with a portfolio of 100 plus investments. A remarkable achievement given that only 13% of women worldwide are involved in venture investment decision making. Shelley's also actively championed state grant funding for Queensland startups and enabled over 3 million in funding to startups for the QUT CEA Creative Tech Fund. Congratulations again, Shelley. We'll now hear from Shelley. Hey everyone, I'm Shelley Trung. I'm the managing partner for Reach Australia. Reach Australia is a scale up program for the real estate technology sector. Uh, we are backed by one of the largest prop tech funds globally, and that's Second Century Ventures. Um, firstly, I just want to say this is such a huge honour to be included in the awards uh, this year. Um, I'm by background, uh, you know, Chinese Australian. My parents are Chinese Vietnamese. Um, I came to Australia when I was two years old as a refugee. Um, we are very glad that we ended up in Australia and I know personally for me I'm very happy to be uh, called Australian and I think I speak for many Australians that uh, we're we are ready to sort of take on more leadership to take on um, more visibility and to offer our connections and networks ideally you know in 10 years time we can look back on this and really see, you know, in Australia and perhaps even globally, um, you know, the leadership is reflective of the population that, you know, it governs, um, you know, whether that be, you know, gender, um, cultural background or sexual orientation. Um, 
So I'd really like to call on, you know, uh, a lot of uh, those in the leadership area to, you know, perhaps step up to some of this, uh, to be open minded about potential change. Um, and perhaps, you know, uh, as a highlight from my sector, um, you know, certainly the real estate technology and venture capital sector itself um, has, you know, traditionally ha lacked a lot of uh, diversity. Um, so this is also a win for them. Uh, thank you very much for the recognition. Um, thank you to the, to the judges, um, also the supporters, uh, those of you viewing at home. Uh, this has such, been such a weird year for, for all of us. Uh, so this has just certainly been such a bright spark uh, to be able to, you know, be part of these awards. Um, and, you know, I'll really celebrate this with all of you by, you know, perhaps doing more for diversity, uh, putting more work into it, um, and, you know, in some ways perhaps quietly, but uh, in other ways perhaps less so. Thank you again. Cheers. Thank you, Shelley. And uh, those of you um, uh, who haven't opened the chat box, there are some absolutely wonderful messages of congratulations coming through to the uh, awardees as we speak. Uh, let's turn now to the education category where we have five very deserving awardees. They are Aisha Ahmed, a technology student at the University of Melbourne, Elena Collinson, a senior researcher at the Aust Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney, Ayushi Kilan, a board member of the v v Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, and Lisa Chin, a director at Odyssey Early Learning. And the winner of the education category is Wessa Chow. Congratulations, Wessa. Wessa is the CEO of Cultural Intelligence, a specialist consultancy firm helping organisations understand the power of cultural diversity. As an advocate for social change, she is a commentator on diversity issues on Australian mainstream media, including The Age, The Guardian, ABC, SBS, and the commercial channels 7, 9, 10. Congratulations, Wessa. We'll now hear from Wessa. My name is Wessa Chow. I'm Chinese Australian and CEO of Cultural Intelligence. I work to help organisations understand the power of cultural diversity and support their culturally diverse staff into senior leadership roles and have been an advocate to champion cultural diversity for 20 years. My vision for Australia's future is to build a society that is truly inclusive and fair, where we have equal representation of people in senior leadership roles across business politics, universities and community, where people are not disadvantaged due to appearances. I ran a session about the Asian paradox and leadership at the Asian Australian Leadership Summit 2020, and a reminder that some cultural upbringing can limit our growth, but also recognising some of it can also be a strength. According to the World Economic Forum, Analytical thinking and innovation will be top, the top skills required in 2025. And this is amplified by COVID because everything is now done online and use data. According to my company's research, Asian Australians are more natural at interpreting data, which will be important skills for businesses if they're keen to stay relevant in future years. Asian Australians will be best placed to contribute to that. Thanks so much, a wonderful message. We now turn to the entrepreneurship category where we have five very deserving awardees. They are Anson Hongwei Zhang, Chief Executive Officer of One Stop Warehouse and Discover Energy. William On, Co-Founder and Director of Shippet. Julia Su, Founder and CEO of Paper Plane. Lynn Padetti, founder and CEO of Outsourcing Angel. And the winner of the entrepreneurship category is Usman Iftikhar, CEO of Catalyzer. Uh, Usman is a systems entrepreneur who passionately utilizes the power of entrepreneurship to collectively solve the global climate emergency and global refugee crisis. He's the co-founder and CEO of Catalyzer, a startup pre-accelerator in Australia, which empowers migrant and refugee entrepreneurs to launch their own business startups. 
Catalyzer has supported 345 migrant and refugee entrepreneurs from 40 plus countries and champions the contributions of migrants and refugee business owners to Australia. An incredibly deserving winner. We'll now hear from Usman. Thank you very much to the 2020 Asian Australian Leadership Summit for this amazing award. Um, I'm Usman Iftikhar. I am the co-founder and CEO of Catalyzer and I'm a proud Pakistani Australian. I came here to Australia about seven years ago now and it has been such an interesting and exciting journey. Um, the reason why I started Catalyzer was because of my own sort of struggles with employment uh, and Catalyzer supports other migrant and refugees to launch their own startups uh, and create their own future. Um, so we have been really privileged to be a part of um, this amazing summit and to, you know, and me personally to, to receive this award. Um, and, and, you know, it's a great recognition of the work that we've been doing at Catalyzer, in particular supporting the Asian Australian relations. We've got so many people from Asian Australian backgrounds that are part of our program, um, who are setting up their businesses, who are connecting with each other, whether they're coming from you know, South Asia, like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, or they're coming from Southeast Asia, um, you know, Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, China, so many different countries, um, and just doing a phenomenal job. Uh, of not only setting their businesses, but also connecting with each other, supporting each other, and creating that cohesive community uh, of leaders who are going to be running Australia in the future. I am absolutely uh, proud of the work that migrapreneurs who have been supported have been doing through this sort of COVID uh, period, uh, but I think that they have a massive role to play uh, over the next sort of few months and years to come, uh, particularly in the economic recovery from COVID. Um, so we've got, um, you know, the teams that we've been supporting through this year are going to be pitching on our demo day on the 18th of November. So please tune in. You can go to our website to find more information. Um, and we'll also be working over the next few years to support as many migrapreneurs as possible across Australia to help them build the businesses of tomorrow that can create jobs and employment opportunities for everyone um, and really, really aid in that economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Usman, for the contribution to the recovery. Uh, we now turn to the public sector and government category where we have four awardees. They are Helen O, oh, a senior associate in New South Wales Trade and Investment at New South Wales Treasury. Jonathan Saw, Global Engagement Manager at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. Helen Zhang, uh, Harvard Kennedy School Researcher and Legal Officer at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And the overall winner of the public sector and government category is Tessa Sullivan, who is currently a lawyer and the officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria, a mediator, an arbitrator, a scientist, and currently at the University of New England. As a lawyer and officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria, Tessa has worked in the area of immigration, human rights, plus family and criminal law, and is the first Thai Chinese national to be elected into government. Her advocacy in the Me Too era and campaigns against violence against women has made her the face of the movement in Australia. She single-handedly changed the legislation in local government to acknowledge and prevent such offences. Congratulations, Tessa. The judging panel were all incredibly impressed by your courage and your conviction. We'll now hear from Tessa. Hi, my name is Tessa Sullivan. I am half Australian and half Thai Chinese. I was born and raised in Thailand. I went to boarding school in Singapore and completed my tertiary education in England, Australia and America. I am currently on a scholarship completing my second master's at Harvard University and I am a law teacher at the University of New England. I currently have a Bachelor of Arts Science from Monash University and a Master's of Laws from Monash University. I am a lawyer, a scientist, a journalist, a mediator and arbitrator and an officer of the Supreme Court of Victoria. As the first Thai national to have ever been elected into politics in Australia, I am proud to have broken the bamboo ceiling. My vision for Australia's future is to promote further diversity in all sectors and encourage greater inclusion. I believe Asian Australians are the perfect bridge between nationalities and in unifying a more international Australia. Post-COVID, I would like to work with key industry and community organisations to promote safety and sustainability for an economically sound and healthy future for all. 
My highlight for the Australian Asian Leadership Summit is this, the chance to meet and talk with like-minded peers and professionals who have an optimistic outlook for a post-COVID future, such as I do. Thank you. Kapkun ma ka, shiasheni, gracias. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, really great to have you online. Um, we move now to the science and medicine category where we have five awardees. They are Dr. Vinnie Gautam, a lecturer at the University of Melbourne, Barry Nguyen, co-founder and CEO of HealthAid, Dr. Jacqueline Romero, a senior lecturer and Westpac Bicentennial Foundation winner at the University of Queensland, and Dr. Zachary Tan, Chief Strategy Officer at CancerAid and Research Fellow at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. And the winner of the Science and Medicine category is Madhu Baskaran, who is a professor and co-leader of Functional Materials and Microsystems Research Group at RMIT University. Uh, Madhu co-leads the Functional Materials and Microsystems Research Group at RMIT. Her work seeks to transform conventional hard electronics into soft and unbreakable products, thin enough to create electronic skin. She co-founded the Women's Research Network at RMIT in 2013, which significantly shaped the university's Gender Equality Action Plan and currently sits on the National Board of Directors for Women in STEM Australia, connecting women, women across all sectors and career stages to each other. Congratulations, Madhu. Let's hear from you now. I'm Madhu Baskaran. I'm an electronics engineering professor at RMIT University in Melbourne. I come from India, from South India, from a city called Chennai, and I came to Australia in 2004. I co-lead a young, vibrant, diverse research group at RMIT University, where we work on translating science fiction into reality. We work on electronic skin, which is sensors which could be worn on the skin like Band-Aid or like nicotine patches, which could be used to monitor the external environment or our own internal body. Now we actively work with industry to translate this cutting edge technology into products which could actually benefit society. This includes deploying sensors within the aged care sector in the form of sensors within mattresses or sensors which could be worn on skin to enhance the quality of care in the aged care facilities. I'm also a passionate advocate for gender equity and being a woman of color in STEM, where STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, this is a particularly important thing to do within Australia. I have worked on national initiatives, which include the Women in STEM Decadal Plan, as well as being a board member of Women in STEM Australia. I love the multiculturalism in Australia, and my vision for a futuristic Australia is where this multiculturalism is actually also reflected in all levels of leadership. Thank you. Thanks so much. We now move to the sport category, and the judges were... Uh... We only had uh, two awardees for this category. So we'd certainly urge each of you to reach out to those who have been successful in the sports area. But each of our awardees are truly exceptional. They are Kashif Bounds, the general manager of the West Western Bulldogs Community Foundation, and the winner of the sport category, Minji Lee, uh, a professional golfer. Many of you will know Minji as an Australian professional golfer from Perth. She became the number one ranked amateur golfer in February 2014 after winning the Oates Victorian Open. She remained number one until turning professional that September. She ended 2018 ranked second on the earnings list with 1.5 million in earnings. In 2019, Minji won a number of events uh, and by late that following month, she'd risen to number two in the women's world golf rankings. So a truly extraordinary Australian successful on the world stage. Let's hear now from Minji. Hi, I'm Minji Lee. I'm an LPGA professional and I'm Australian and my parents are Korean, so I have a Korean background. I'm proud to be able to represent Australia all over the world and I'm also very proud to be able to do it as an Asian Australian. I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody involved with this award, but especially PwC Australia, the Australian National University, AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne and Johnson Partners. The advice that I'd give to young Asian Australians would be to lead by example. There's always 
um, other younger children and girls and boys who are um, looking up to you as an example, so always be a role model to them. Wonderful, Minji. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us via video. Uh, we turn now to the last of the nine categories, and that is the professions and legal category where we have five awardees. They are Harry Hong, Chief Executive Officer of Tailored Accounts, Tuan Nguyen, Director of Legal at PwC, Melissa Ran, Head of Community at Airtree Ventures, and Christine Jung, CEO and Principal Psychologist at Beyond Story AAOP. And the winner of the professions and legal category and the overall winner of the awards for 2020 is Lima Nguyen. And Lima, who joins us from Darwin, has <laughs> Uh, Lima has a bunch of friends in the background of her chambers. Uh, I'll just introduce Lima, but uh, thanks for all of the support team. Um, and uh, I must say the judges were just overwhelmed by Lima's uh, candidacy. Um, Lima, for those of you that do not know Lima yet, has provided over 10 years of pro bono legal services to hundreds of victims of the Khmer Rouge regime including foreign nationals, a member of the Cambodian diaspora, plus ethnic Vietnamese civilians who were the subject of genocide atrocities. Dealing with contemporary human rights and statelessness concerns, Lima is deemed an international expert in nationality laws, also practicing at the bar in Darwin. Her work predominantly focuses on criminal cases, but also includes youth justice, mental health, human rights, admin law, disciplinary committees, and tribunal matters. The judges were incredibly moved by the impact you've had, Lima, uh, on both locally and on the global stage. And I'd like now to pass over to you for your acceptance speech. Thank you, Lima. Thank you, Jason, for such a warm um, welcoming. Um, I also acknowledge all my friends and supporters and colleagues here uh, who I have in chambers to celebrate this very special event with me today. Um, <clears throat> it is with gratitude that I come uh, before you to accept this award and in doing so I must reflect on how fortunate I have been to have come from nothing to become something. I've never forgotten my humble beginnings commencing with my birth at Cuckoo Island refugee camp in Indonesia. I was only a few months old when my family were formally recognised as asylum seekers. We lived at Galang refugee camp close to the border with Singapore for about one and a half years, wondering where in the world we would end up. In 1983, my family were granted a humanitarian visa, permitting us to settle in Australia. I grew up in the Brisbane suburb of Dara in what I have often referred to in jest as the Vietnamese ghetto. I recall my grade one teacher at Dara State Primary School teasing me about my shoes flipping and flopping on my feet because they were a few sizes too big. My family, when we first came to Australia, wore mixed matched clothing donated to us by the Red Cross, St. Vincent de Paul and uh, Salvation Army. And our family trips to the dump were also a treasure hunt as we often used to find toys that were thrown away. I got my very first guitar from the dump. I, and, and of course, I learned how to play music from that. So on reflection, my prevailing love for op shopping must have derived from my fond memories of those days where trash and treasure were one and the same. This, this lovely dress that I'm wearing is from St. Vincent de Paul and I'm proud of it. Yeah. I left home at the age of 17 and I have had no firm life plans. I did not commence my university studies at the University of Queensland with law. Instead, I studied philosophy, peace and conflict studies, history, religion, psychology, just random subjects about which I liked to ponder. It was only after realizing that if any real change were to take effect in the areas of human rights, social justice and peace, it was more likely to be within the realm of uh, international and domestic legal frameworks than as an armchair philosopher that prompted me to study law. 
In my 20s, I travelled extensively, volunteering in places like East Timor, Nigeria, doing an international club trip in Singapore, backpacking Europe, trying to explore the depths of my inner and outer world. I recall that when returning to Australia, Australian customs would often stop me at the airport and ask me to step aside. They would then carefully take out items from my luggage and scrutinise those items to the point of reading my personal journal. It took me a while to figure out that it was because I was profiled as a drug smuggler. <laughs> well, it does make sense, doesn't it, when you have Nguyen as your surname, when you have an address in Dara, when you have a place of birth on your passport as Cuckoo Island, and entry stamps from and to major source countries such as Nigeria and Singapore, and then being an Asian Australian immigrant at the time, flying through another drug port, Sydney, on my way home. <laughs> so it all fell into place. <clears throat> now, in legal practice, words are the tool of our trade. Words are black and white on a page, but life is never black and white. The stories and lives that I've come across in my practice are multi-dimensional, multi-coloured, multi-layered paintings of lived experiences reflecting many human conditions and possible realities. I believe that we are all equal before the law and I live that out when I represent clients before courts and tribunals, both international and domestic. In my last Supreme Court trial, I defended an elderly Indonesian fisherman the master of a foreign vessel alleged to have fished in Australian waters. After having spent three days in prison and three months in immigration detention, he was back in Australia to face trial for the third time in the same case. In the middle of that third trial, he became involuntarily detained in a psychiatric unit of the Royal Darwin Hospital. And I found myself back and forth between the hospital and the court. My role at that juncture had become much more than just being his barrister. My client had suicidal ideation and the trial at that point had to stop. For him, that case was a matter of life and death. When I defend Indonesian fishermen who find themselves before criminal courts in Australia, prosecuted with the offence of fishing illegally in Australian waters, I never forget that my parents came by boat to their country, Indonesia, and without anybody's permission, my mother gave birth to me on their soil. We were not punished for this apparent act against their sovereignty, not the way that asylum seekers who find themselves detained indefinitely in outback Australia or on Nauru or Manus Island are punished for their mode of arrival in Australia by boat. I've been asked whether I have experienced discrimination in the legal profession. Discrimination can be nuanced and appears in many forms. And it's difficult to discern whether any adverse treatment that I have faced has been based on being a woman in a traditionally male dominated profession or due to my Asian appearance that has a tendency to uh, be perceived as looking younger than my age or uh, being inexperienced. I can say that during the years when I represented genocide victims at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, I was often asked, who are you interning to? I was in fact, international counsel, working alongside national Cambodian counsel, representing victims of mass and historical crimes before the tribunal. However, it was probably not an unwarranted question because I was only 27 at the time. I probably looked 17. <laughs> my client group in that international court were the ethnic Vietnamese minority who had resided in Cambodia on the floating villages of the Tonle Sap River for generations. The tribunal ultimately found that the Khmer Rouge senior leadership com committed acts of genocide against this group. And my clients had survived because they had been forcibly removed to Vietnam, which in itself was deemed to be a crime against humanity. The Vietnamese government, in an effort to save lives, exchanged bags of salt and, were and that was the reason my clients were able to survive. 
They had been traded with salt and were able to, be, to reside in Vietnam whilst mass executions took place against members of the group in Cambodia. My work with this group uncovered that genocidal acts against this group had generational impact, including present day social marginalization and lack of identity in Cambodia. An unforgettable moment for me in my work was when the village chief of my client's village presented me with two rare fish from the Tonle Sap River, which she had carefully dried, salted, wrapped up in the Phnom Penh newspaper, ready for me to take back to my parents in Australia. <laughs> of course, all I could think about was Australian customs and the strict <laughs> airport quarantine regulations at the border. But looking back, that situation was one of the greatest expressions of appreciation that I had received from my clients who could never afford private legal representation. Fishing was their livelihood, and this was their way of saying thank you. In June 2018, I was qualified by the International Criminal Court to be referred cases to represent victims of atrocity crimes or accused persons charged with those crimes. I considered this to be a milestone in my career. However, in the very same week, the jury trial before the Supreme Court in Darwin, an elderly white male acting judge made it clear to me that he did not like me. I was berated and castigated in a manner I hadn't experienced before. It was suggested by this man that I needed to prove my legal qualifications. It remains unknown to me the true reason behind the judge's obvious disdain towards me, but it may be another example of subtle discrimination. Perhaps it's still the case that Asian women are expected to behave meekly rather than robustly, even in the courtroom. Judicial bullying has become an issue very close to my heart. There is a significant power imbalance in the courtroom and judges must realize the devastating impacts their words and conduct may have on those tasked with appearing before them. I have learned that in my profession, you can only succeed if you have a sense of who you truly are at core. You cannot let yourself be blown this way and that by the wind in all directions. You will represent high profile cases, unpopular cases, you will represent corporations, and then you will represent the underdog. You cannot rely on being loved and glorified by some and then hated and berated by others. Dealing with gruelling judges and difficult clients will test your limitations and boundaries each and every day. Being the winner of the 2020 Asian Australian Leadership Awards is an extraordinary honour. It might have been that I uh, could have ended up by potluck anywhere else in the world into any other situation, but here I am in Australia with the privilege of an Australian education and fulfilling work. Australia's Asian heritage is an enormous asset to this country and cultural diversity in leadership needs to be a priority if we are to ensure multi-dimensional perspectives in positions of influence. I'd like to thank Johnson Partners, uh, Australian National University, PricewaterCoopers uh, um, and AsiaLink and the organisers of this noble endeavour for your initiative. And I do hope that this time next year, we will be able to come together face to face to continue to be inspired and to celebrate diversity in leadership across so many important sectors of our Australian community. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to share with you um, the view from my chambers <laughs> of um, all my friends and supporters. <laughs> Lima, thank you, and to all of your friends uh, and family in attendance, thank you for the incredibly warm and generous support. Um, Lima, I had tears in my eyes. I was reading the chat box. So many others were moved to tears as well. Thank you for sharing that story. It's a remarkable story and one that needs to be retold. Uh, there were even some suggestions that Netflix might pick it up, but uh, um, there <laughs> It won't be the last time it's told and it, it deserves to be told, but you've shared so clearly why the judges were so touched, so moved and so compelled to identify you as the overall winner this year. 
and we know that you will be a wonderful ambassador for the next 12 months, which is a wonderful segue to our next speaker who will share the closing address. Manira Bano uh, was the recipient of the, uh, and the overall winner of the awards uh, last year, our inaugural year. And as I said at the outset, I was incredibly touched equally by Manira's speech in the uh, hallowed halls of uh, Melbourne Library. Uh, I'll pass now to Manira. Thanks, Manira. Thank you so much, Jason, for giving me this opportunity to share the end of the ceremony and uh, this time to celebrate the under 40 most influential Asian Australian leader for 2020. So first of all, my heartiest congratulations to Lima for winning this year's well-deserved award. And I know what an emotional moment this is going to be for you because I've been there. <laughs> Um, I can't believe it's already one year to that award ceremony in Melbourne and what a year it turned out to be. 2020, uh, where the pandemic was not just a health crisis, but we also witnessed the worst of the racism, xenophobia and um, the global events that led to the Black Lives Mov uh, Movement, uh, sorry, Black Lives Matter movements. And, uh, I remember last year in my speech, I referred to one ceiling that was not mentioned throughout the summit. And uh, I would like to bring that back this year as well. The concrete ceiling that exists for the Pashtun women and their pursuit to education and empowerment. And for the whole year, this became the theme of my story, blasting the concrete ceiling. Glass, bamboo or concrete, what are these ceilings anyway? just metaphors or perhaps the, our personal psychological barriers. I define them as a glass ceiling would allow you to see through it, you can't move up. A bamboo ceiling will let you hear what's happening on the other side, you can't see and you can't move. A concrete ceiling will not let you perceive any reality beyond the confinement. And what do you do then? And that's where I shared my story last year because when you can't see, you still dream. You can do that. No one can stop you from dreaming. And once you have that dream, it's your choice how hard you are determined to work on it to turn that dream into reality. So anyone who tells you that you can't be what you can't see, be the first one. And last year, I was the first one. It's been eight years since I arrived in Australia as an international student with no family and not a single friend in this entire country. But one thing was clear, to associate with anyone here or be a friend or work for someone, I will not change who I am, neither my name nor my accent. Why would I spend the prime of my life trying to be something that I'm not, just because someone who is so limited in their acceptance and inclusion beyond that they can't see beyond the layers of discrimination, me as a human and the values that I can bring to a multicultural society. And that's where the Asian Australian Summit last year came and it provided me with the platform where I was accepted for who I was. And it has been an absolute honor to be ambassador for this program for the last one year. Everywhere I go in Australia and right now this year, I wasn't able to travel, but everywhere I connect with people through this uh, community of Asian Australian and also the Science and Technology Australia superstar of STEM. In every state, now I have a family of like-minded people. I always proudly told everyone who I am and where I came, came from. I am an Australian, but I was an immigrant, a single Muslim Pashtun woman from Pakistan. I was told that these could be considered as barriers uh, that will reinforce each other in a vicious cycle. No, they were my badges of honor and I'm proud of them. Any ceiling above our head is put there because of who we are, how we are defined by the society. And to break any ceiling, you have to embrace your superpower of authenticity. Thank you once again, ANU, Asia Link, PwC and uh, Johnson Partners for organizing this amazing event and giving us the emerging Asian Australian leaders a platform of visibility and empowerment to achieve our dreams. And Lima, 
Have a great celebration. I really look forward to meeting you one day in person. Thank you so much, everyone. Back to you, Jason. Thank you, Manira. Um, I, I, again, watching the chat box, uh, we've all had tears in our eyes. What an inspirational storyteller uh, and story you share, Manira. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart. I'm the father of four children. Uh, two of them, Lotus and Tara, are adopted from Taiwan. And these awards make me feel incredibly confident that they will um, grow up in a country where they are not only accepted, but given all the same opportunities as my biological children. And that fills me with hope um, and, uh, and delight. So with the sort of leadership we've seen today, you know, I leave today's awards just so uplifted, so encouraged. So thank you to all 40 of you, to Manira and the team from last year, to Lima and the incredible cohort uh, for this year. Thank you. Let's keep up the momentum and let's make this country an even better country. I look forward to seeing you all throughout the year. Hopefully next year's awards can be live in person as they were last year. Um, for the 40, we will be in touch to organize a network so that we can start some tremendous opportunities to engage that tremendous capability and collective energy. Look forward to staying in touch. Thank you and goodbye.